All right, um, at a high level, <laughs> there's an inside joke there for some of my students. At a high level, this is a largely extemporaneous talk guided by a handful of PowerPoint slides. On a lighter note, hopefully it's 12 to 15 minutes that addresses the really important things you should be thinking about for the next four to 40 years of your life. So hopefully I haven't set the bar too high for myself. So what I'd really like to do is talk about a few big educational ideas and do so through the lens of some experimentation a colleague of mine, Scott Strong, and I have been doing on some of the people in the room, uh, students. So some of the ideas I'd like to address, uh, the idea of a growth versus a fixed mindset. Um, so there actually are quite a few really good TED Talks that have to do specifically with the idea of a growth mindset. This is the idea that we can keep on learning, we can keep on improving, our intelligence, our ability is not a fixed quantity, but that it can emerge and evolve and grow throughout time. Um, the contrast to that would be a fixed mindset, the idea that those are fixed characteristics, I will never be smarter tomorrow than I am today, um, and I will never have more capabilities than I do today. And those are actually very restrictive ways to think if one wants to be successful in life. Um, there's also the idea that as engineering students, as STEM students, uh, there really is room for some sort of creative exploration. Um, although I would say parenthetically, uh, it probably ought to be guided. Otherwise, chemistry labs would be blowing up all over campuses. Um, and then fundamentally, uh, what I really want to focus my talk on is the power and the importance of failure. Uh, and this actually ties in very tightly with the idea of a fixed mindset. Um, when we look at, uh, at least when Scott and I were looking at our perceptions of students, our fear was that our students maybe tended to have a fixed mindset, um, a fear of failure, uh, and they were risk averse. We couldn't get creative stuff out of them to the extent that we wanted to. And so we actually built a slightly different paradigm that I'll get to in a few slides. So um, the big question I would start this off with is from the student's experiment, experience, and I have to go back a while for, to, to draw in mine, but my perception is these ideas are formally discussed largely in something like a freshman success seminar that we have on campus here. You guys may or may not remember this, but you discussed these ideas in your freshman success seminar. That said, it's a one half credit hour class that unless you're really not contributing to it, you're gonna get an A in. So it doesn't have your undivided attention your first term here. Next question, how do we reinforce these throughout the curriculum? I think we're doing a better job of this now than 25 years ago when I was a student. Uh, but my answer would be this was not reinforced at all except maybe accidentally by an exceptional faculty member or two along the way. This talk hopefully will explore, well, definitely will explore some of my thoughts uh, and hopefully some of your thoughts. And uh, I'm going to try to model this and I'm going to embody it in a few quotes and silly gifts. And this is uh, thanks in no small part to my collaborator, Scott Strong, uh, who... Uh, I don't know, has encouraged me to do the following thing, just to kind of mess with students' heads a little bit. On every assignment, there is a quote. That quote may or may not have anything to do whatsoever with the assignment. <laughs> These quotes are drawn from great scientists, great mathematicians, rappers, books, literature, movies, you name it. I think we quoted the dude on an exam last semester. And then the silly gifts are, well, I had to put the E and the T into the TED Talk. For those of you not aware, this is technology, education, not education, entertainment, and design. I'll try not to educate you. <laughs> silly gift, first quote. Okay, what is experience? Experience is usually what you get when you don't get what you wanted. And it's often the case that experience is the most valuable thing you have to offer. It's a quote from Randy Pausch's last lecture. Okay, in addition to watching TED Talks, this is definitely something worth watching on the internet. I would encourage you to do it. Um, 
why did I choose this quote? Why did I choose this GIF? Uh, if you focus on this image, uh, third guy from the left pops right back up. My guess, as somebody who's fallen over on a bike a handful of times, is this is the person that's maybe experienced this the most. And I suspect won the event. Okay? So how does this tie into my talk? Um, well, experience is what we want to give you through the academic, through the, the intellectual uh, growth process here. Um, and I'd like to explore what kind of the standard is, at a, again, at a high level, uh, for learning objectives in STEM education in the current age. Of course, there's a certain knowledge base we expect uh, to expose all of our students to. Um, we would like our students to be able to extend and apply this knowledge in new and innovative ways. Uh, we'd like you all to be able to communicate across disciplines and across teams to solve actual, real-world, meaningful problems. And we would like to instill in our students a resilience and a curiosity that leads towards lifelong learning uh, and an ability to persist through difficulty. Because as it turns out, STEM is neither static nor easy. I think, I think it's fair to say we've all experienced this. Okay, so those are the big high-level objectives. Next quote. It's a mistake to think that you can solve any major problem with just potatoes. And I found a related GIF somehow. <laughs> all right, so our problem is those objectives I just listed, those are highly aspirational and non-trivial objectives. How do we meet those? Well, what I'd like to do is kind of start off by exploring the traditional undergraduate experience in STEM. What does this look like to you guys? It's very, very deep in disciplinary content uh, that's delivered by experts with an emphasis on procedural expertise. In John's talk, that big block in the middle was all that. These are all the facts you have to know, these are the formulas you have to be able to apply, and by God, be able to apply them well, and here's a thousand problems to practice on. There are a lot of lectures, there are labs, that instill this, this body of fixed, this fixed body of knowledge that is deeply rooted in the past, and necessarily so, right? Uh, when Einstein, or not Einstein, when Newton said he was standing on the, the, the shoulders of giants, he was referring to everybody that had laid the foundation for him to develop uh, the springboard end to physics and mathematics as we know it now. So we have to pay attention to the past, but our lectures and our activities and classes tend to focus a lot more on the past than in the future. Okay? In terms of how we judge and assess you, there's a heavy emphasis on retention and repetition of facts and on computational competency. Am I reading the room okay? Is that a fair statement? Okay. I would say, at a, from my perspective, this is a pretty low risk thing for an instructor to do and for an institution to do, to deliver the academic content in this manner. However, I have to ask the question, are we trying to solve a major problem with just potatoes? And, I, and I've come to the conclusion that, yes, we have. All right, quote number three. To hell with circumstances, I create opportunities. This should have special me meaning to my knowledge. We've stopped calling them math problems this semester. We're calling them mathematical opportunities. <laughs> this is also one of the best videos you'll find on the internet. Bruce Lee is playing ping pong with his nunchucks. You should all practice this at home. Okay, so really quickly, just a short history of me as an educator. Uh, I am under a time limit, so I can't brag about myself too much. Okay, so a couple things. Uh, I started as an educator at this institution as an instructional faculty member when I was 24. I'm 47 today. This is my 23rd year of this. Okay. Um, I've been doing this a long time. As a 24-year-old, I made a really key discovery in the classroom. You guys are smart. And if I expect a lot of you, 
more often than not, I don't walk away disappointed. John might be cringing at the triple negative I just used in that sentence. So philosophically, I think students have a tremendous amount of potential, and I think we often undervalue the existence of that potential. Okay? I will also say that the traditional approach, the potatoes approach, I excel at. Okay? I don't mean that to be boastful. It's, I, I love the mathematics that I get to teach students here. I love that the students are engaged in it. That passion comes across. I can engage a room of 40 or 80 students in a lecture, and I can do it well. And I can train them up on all the little computational intricacies, and I can give them exams till they're blue in the face, and they can do well on them. And as an educator, for the first 15 years I was doing this, I got increasingly good feedback for just that approach. In fact, the last handful of semesters that I really did everything the traditional way, I was often getting perfect, perfect evaluations from my students at the end of the semester. That's 40 out of 40 students in a class saying, this was outstanding. And I had to ask myself, is that good enough? And this is the answer I would like you to give me if I'm giving you feedback like you're outstanding every week. If I ask you, is that good enough? Probably not. Okay, maybe there's some more potential there. So this led me to trying something different. And this gets me into really the key components of this talk. Um, Scott Strong, other colleagues and I would talk all the time. Uh, it just so happened that Scott and I ended up landing a grant to explore some of these conversations we would sometimes have over coffee or beer. And we'd often discuss the fact that our students are really good and they really like what we're doing when we do this traditional approach to educating them, but we weren't quite sure that we were doing a, a total service to our students. Um, we were maybe ignoring some of those things that were the high-level objectives for how we educate engineering and STEM students. Um, and specifically, we discuss a lot the idea that you guys come in here and your math is sound. There are little things that maybe are carryovers from something goofy that happened in a high school algebra class. But you remediate, you figure it out, you do really well. It's almost impossible for us to break freshmen in mathematics. That's my perspective. You guys might feel like we try to break you quite often, but I think you're good. Um, what we don't necessarily do is help you become better learners beyond just our class. And so what Scott and I decided to do, and it was supported in large part by successfully writing a grant and getting support and really leverage to convince our department head that it's okay for us to do something crazy, was to, rather than focus entirely on mathematics in our freshman honors calculus three class, so this is a class for students that come in, they're placed out of two semesters of calculus already. Uh, in order to get there, they have either taken calculus in concurrent enrollment in another university or two-year school, or they got the highest possible score on the hardest possible AP math exam. We can't break those mathematically. So this is, from our perspective, a low-risk pool of students to experiment on. So here's the big idea. Um, let's try something very different. And the different thing we decided to try was, okay, these students have done very well on every math test they've ever taken. Some of you are in the room right now. You've done very well on every math test you've ever taken. 95% uh, is a disappointment. We come in day one and we said, eh, we don't care. We're not going to judge you that much on how well you do your mathematics in this class. Instead, we're going to judge you on how well you think about your mathematics and communicate that to us. A little bit of a paradigm change, okay? So we created a studio environment that focused on often problem sets that weren't even possible. And we turned students loose in groups, and we saw what they would do with it. And we told our TAs, judge them harshly if they don't organize their thoughts well, or demonstrate reflective practice. Okay, so what could go wrong with an, with an approach like this? Well, there was some student pushback, particularly in year one. I think it was better this year. So we've been doing this for a couple of years. 
Um, there were disastrous assignments. Josh in the front row was nodding his head as I was talking about impossible problems. Sometimes we just throw an idea on the page and see what students do with it. This is not something you typically do with freshmen, you do it with grad students, but we thought, why not try? Um, I would also say I had a handful of colleagues that told me I was just flat crazy. I buy extra contact time with students, uh, my evaluations are going to go down, there's, just, there's no good that can come of this. The flip side of that is what could possibly go right? So the students that engaged in this, we asked them to keep journals, we asked them to write reflectively, we asked them to do, even when we give them practice problems, do those reflectively. Let's just look at some things that happened here. So they adopted a, a, a reflective set of practices. So I'm just gonna put up a few exemplars. This is a math assignment. It's a two page handwritten essay on growth mindset. That's kind of cool. This is a set of math practice problems. In fact, this is a set of math practice problems that were done wrong and then revisited in the journal uh, with corrections in different colors and notes about what, I, what, what misconception did I demonstrate in this. That's reflective practice. Here's another one, a student, in, it doesn't quite pop on this screen, but you've got the work and then in dark red, uh, a dialogue about how I think about this type of problem. What else could go right? Well, students explored concepts and tools we presented to them and went way beyond anything we asked in assignments. So one of our early assignments was actually a junior or senior level partial differential equations problem, where we asked students to play around with Mathematica and explore the behavior of a particular two-dimensional wave equation. Okay, they were given the tools to play with this. They were asked to animate a simple case. I had one student come to me and say, look at what I did. Is that kind of cool? And she actually figured out how to mouse over and click and get this to actually add no modes. What else happened? Um, students succeeded on assignments that were well above the level of the course. So this is a midterm project. I want to get to the last bit of it. This is just a handful of a 22-page write-up in LaTeX. Uh, and the graph you have embedded there it demonstrates quadratic approximations through the second order Taylor approximation to an egg crate looking function to characterize uh, critical point behavior using linear algebra. 17 year old in, in a freshman class. So those are the kinds of things that can happen when we take the wheels off. We've also been able to engage TAs uh, in multiple years and we have students developing content. So I'm just going to give you a couple of really quick thoughts. Uh, some constraints on the model, there are resource constraints, uh, there was a penalty for evaluation when we made it way too hard the first semester. Students were not kind to us. Um, I would say there's no silver bullet. This is, I think, working for me. I don't think it's the answer for everybody. And I want to leave you with an audience assignment. As students, as educators, we should always be thinking about what can we do to make our experience better. How can we recognize how we learn and how can we do things better? How can we push ourselves further? And on that, I'll leave you with a comic strip. Thank you very much.